the two talks I'm giving is um, was presented in Armidale by Dr. David Johnson, who I suspect many of you know, and um, he's a very good speaker and um, a very very uh, long uh, history of working in beef cattle R and D in this country. He's made a great contribution to Breed Plan, and he certainly gave a, a challenging talk up there. Um, I'm hopeful of that I do a reasonable job filling in his shoes. If I stumble on the odd occasion, please forgive me. Um, I haven't tried to reshape this talk, so it's pretty much David's talk. It will be, be the odd moment where I have to collect, collect my thoughts a little bit. Um, I'm also a little bit, uh, I'll say nervous, I can't think of the right word, because what I've got to say, I think you're going to find reasonably challenging between the two talks. Um, I'll preface what I'm going to say by suggesting to you that uh, this breed doesn't actually have a lot of time left to make some good decisions. Um, it's been in this country for whatever it is, 150, 160 years and obviously made a great contribution to the community and the beef industry. Um, but the last 20 years have basically seen you lose your market share to Angus and the result that, that <coughs> happening didn't happen because some horrible person came and changed mm. the colour on the telly or something like that. It's because of decisions made by individuals and the, and the association uh, over those 20 years and obviously decisions made by Angus. Um, I think you've still got some time to uh, rebuild. The technology's there. I'm going to try and show you that the technology's there in the next um, 30 or 40 minutes. Um, but it's your choices that will determine whether Hereford gets back to being kind of the predominant uh, beef cattle breed in um, Australia or southern Australia. Um, it's going to require decisions made by you as individual breeders and also by your board and it's going to take probably five, ten years of pretty hard work to get there I suspect because it's taken 20 years to get where you are now. And so um, unlike Ben I don't have lots of promising messages about what the markets are going to do and the Aussie dollar and so forth. Basically my message is you've got some choices, the tools are there, but nobody else is going to make good decisions for you and if you don't make good decisions I can pretty well guarantee that you'll be a completely irrelevant history breed in another 20 years. So this is the talk that David started, slightly summarised by me, shortened a little bit and as I said if I stumble every so often please forgive me. But it's really about what, where you're going, where you could be in the next uh, 10 years and beyond. I'm going to touch briefly on the, the kind of raw materials of creating whatever sort of cattle you want to produce. Um, and that's genetic variation, genetic differences between animals. And I'll talk a little bit about how we use that raw materials to make improvement. We'll touch very briefly on the Hereford progeny test because I'll be talking about that a bit after morning tea. And then just a bit of for thinking forward about some of the, the challenges that I, I believe that you um, have in front of you. Now, this is kind of cattle pornography, I suppose. Um, at least some bits of it are. Um, and probably different of us think different bits of pornography. Um, the, the reason for the picture is, is purely to show you that there's humongous genetic differences within the cattle populations of the world. I'm sure you all know that. These are different breeds. We won't go into what they are, but they all basically came from one or two original cattle types, probably somewhere in the Middle East or India. And all that's happened over the last two or three hundred years is people have kind of uncovered different combinations that they've found to be useful for some purpose, and they've turned them into what we currently think of as breeds. And as you can see, the differences between breeds in almost anything you like to think of is enormous in size, in milk production, certain aspects of body shape, etc, etc. Now any of you who are interested in dog breeding, um, you'll know that the same sort of story there, there's unbelievable diversity among dog breeds. And all that is is really genetic variation. So same thing exists within the cattle population. There are huge differences in the genes that make up cattle and those differences are available to you to breed whatever sort of animal you want to breed. Even within the one breed, there's huge diversity. I'm sure all of you know this 
within Herefords much, much better than a person like me would ever know. You know lots and lots about the different types of Herefords, how they perform, etc. You probably know some of these um, animals in these, these pictures. Um, the really important point is all Hereford cattle are not the same. Even though to an outsider like me, they kind of look pretty similar, and I'd have to tell you they do, which we'll get on to later on because it's a really effective brand. But under the skin, the genetic differences are enormous, and you can access those genetic differences to breed whatever sort of cattle you want to. The fact that they come in a Hereford package basically doesn't limit you at all. So, genetic variation, the differences in the genetic makeup of animals, that's the raw material of creating the cattle that you're, you're putting on the market tomorrow and into the future. And so, when your customers make decisions about the genes they're going to be farming, they might make a choice about breeds, then they make a choice between uh, uh, within breeds. They'll, they'll choose which bulls they're going to buy. And they might go into a straight breeding or a cross breeding system or whatever. But what we're really about is trying to make sure that first of all, they pick Hereford. I presume that's what you want. And then secondly, that they produce, they buy bulls that are going to make more money for them. And notice I say for them. Your customers are the people who matter, not you. If you want to be in business in 10 years time, you got to keep on giving better and better cattle at the right price to your customers. Genetic variation is the raw material to help you do it. But if you don't do the best job for the customers, you won't be here. So the next point is, of course, genetics is not the whole story in productivity. And we all know that the environment is part of it. But the remarkable thing is you can actually predict the performance of animals pretty well. Don't worry about the little bit of maths there. It's very, very straightforward. Animals get half their genes from their mum, half their genes from their dad, and then wrapped around that is whatever the production system is, whatever nutrition and animal health and so forth that the animals are going to get. Now, one of the big uh, kind of excuses, basically, that one often hears when talking to people in uh, cattle or sheep breeding, and particularly in breeds that are kind of falling behind, is people saying things like, oh, you don't have to worry about the genetics, it's just a tiny part of the overall story. Well, it's sort of a tiny part, but it's completely and utterly fundamental. Because if you don't have the genetics to do the job, you don't exist, full stop. So, yes, there are differences between animals if you give them lots of food and if you give them less food, but their genes determine what they're going to do with that food. And more and more, producers are going to do a reasonable job of supplying nutrition, health, whatever good management is there. And it's the genes they get from your bulls that will determine whether they're a bit ahead of the gross margin curve or they're falling behind. So don't, please don't anybody here think and come up to me afterwards and say, look, it's 90% of it's what goes down their throat. It's complete crap. Um, it's just a waste of time even thinking about it. And your business is to make sure they can get the best package of genes and then they apply, the commercial producer applies their skills and their money to putting the, the most cost effective package of nutrition and health and so forth in front of those genes and the genes then turn that into money. And so what you've got to do is make sure they turn it into as much money as possible. So yes, genetics is part of the story, but it's fundamental. And, and th the other nice thing is um, as I said, you get half your genes from your mum, half your genes from your dad, and that kind of works out, means that you can actually predict the performance of animals at the point of birth, and we'll talk about genomics a bit more later because that's kind of about that, but it also means uh, commercial producers can forward plan pretty well. If they know what bulls they've been buying, they can pretty well predict the performance of the commercial herd next year and the year after and so forth. So we live in a much more uh, predictable environment in a way than we did 20 or 30 years ago. I'm not saying that the climate's predictable, like it's kind of is a bit. Nobody knows what the markets are really going to do, but we can do a reasonable job. And it used to be that genetics was, an, an, was the other big uncertainty. Nobody really knew what they were buying. Well, that's been completely turned on its head. If you're using a system like Breedplan, your customers know what they're getting, and you've got to exploit that. So, just spent a few minutes talking about genetic variation or genetic differences, which is the, the, the differences amongst animals in their genetic makeup 
and your job is to try to get the best packages of those genes together to sell to your customers. So the next point we're going to spend a few minutes on is, is just thinking about how we can describe those so they know what they're buying and so you know what you're picking. And the, the really fundamental point, and I'm sure everybody here knows this, the really fundamental point of working out which animals have got the best genes is to actually measure performance. That's called performance recording, that's pretty straightforward. And that involves records for things like weighing animals, scanning them for fat and muscle, scoring them for some traits. It means taking account of the, the group of animals that a particular young bull or young heifer was run with. And that's the uh, point two there, contemporary group. So that takes account of where they were actually uh, living and growing. And then the third thing we take account of is, is, the, uh, is the parentage. It's really helpful to know which is the mum and the dad of each young bull or young heifer if we want to work out the genetic material of those young animals. Um, traditional way of doing that is to mother up so you know which cows were mated to which bull and then which calf was mated to which, um, was born to which cow. More recently people are starting to use DNA parentage and we'll talk a bit more about that in the future. But the really, this in a nutshell is, this is what's needed for breed plant. We need some records of performance, we need to know where the animal was, who it was running with, and we need to know something about its pedigree. And that allows us to actually kind of dissect or get into and understand its genetic makeup really accurately. And so we'll go on with that for a moment. Um, breed plan is the system, as I've been talking about, it was developed in this country um, for the Australian beef industry with a lot of input from uh, particularly Angus and Hereford breeders over the years, back in the 70s and 80s and 90, 90s. It's based, as I said, on using performance and pedigree records and it takes account of that performance and by knowing which animals related to which and which ones are being compared with which, you can actually separate out how much of the performance of this animal was due to its genetic makeup and how much was just a function of where it was growing and what time it was growing. And that's why we say there separates E to get G, which is the genes part, and that's what you see as EBVs or estimated breeding values. Um, as I said, you really got to have this management group or contemporary group comparison identified. So just putting all the data from your stud into one big pile and and sending it off to, to a breed plan is not going to be as good as identifying which animals will run together at different stages in their growth. It's also good to know things like the age of the dam um, and some other factors like that. But, but basically what it's doing is it's separating out the genetics of the animal from the non-genetic parts of its <coughs> performance. Currently we're doing a lot of research uh, and Agbu's close to being world leader in this for the beef industry. Um, doing a lot of research on adding the ability to use DNA information directly in calculating EBVs. But um, the key point is that's what breed plan is doing. It's separating out the genetic makeup of each animal from the environmental factors that have affected its performance. And it's the genetic bit that is expressed in the EBVs, which I'm reasonably sure you're all familiar with. So let's just have a look at some EBVs for a moment. This is. Uh, a bunch of EBVs. <coughs> These will be averages, won't they, Andrew? Uh, that's an individual animal, I think. Right. That's a average. So let's not go into which animals they are. This row across here is the EBVs, and you can see. Is this going to point up? Yeah. Didn't make the thing blow up. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a, a simple one birth weight EBV. Here, plus 0.4.1. This means that, uh, I'll say this animal it is, has got genes that are worth four kilos heavier birth weight than the average of uh, this year's drop. And, uh, oh no, 2,000 drop, isn't it? Sorry, Andrew. Oh, my, my apologies. This is one of those stumbles. You might think of it falling flat on my face, actually. But, um, Breed average at the moment for 2011 drop calves is 4.4. This animal's 4.1, so its, its genes are worth slightly less birth weight than the average of the 2011 uh, calves. Same principle across here, all these traits you're familiar with. You've got an EBV, which is expressing the genes of that animal in the units of the trait. And uh, 
we'll get back onto accuracy later on, but there's accuracy providers as well. And we can make that comparison with the average of all the calves born in, in this case, 2011. So for, for every single trait there, we can make a comparison of that animal with the average of its contemporaries. And that allows you as the breeder to start saying, well, is this animal one that I want to use as a herd sire or a, um, a replacement heifer? or do I want to sell it, and if you're selling it, it allows the commercial producer to say, what, how good a job is this animal going to do for my commercial operation? But the key thing is, these numbers across that row, the EBV row, they are, the, they are descriptions of the value of the animal's genes for each of those traits. And that is really, <coughs> really neat. We've taken the performance of the animals, like when they were born they might have weighed 45 kilos or something and we've worked out how much of that is due to how different its genes are from the average of the population and that's what that figure is there. The average of the population was 4.4, this animal's 4.1 so it's genetically slightly lighter for birth weight and it'll pass that on to its progeny and we can do that essentially for every trait that we've got records of and that is just such a powerful tool because remember I started off, we had the picture of all the different types of cattle or all the different Hereford bulls. We know there's lots and lots of differences there, but a picture doesn't actually tell you very much. Well, this is now telling us exactly about the genetic differences between animals. And we can use that to help us make um, mating decisions or buying decisions. And you can see, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, there's a bunch of calving traits, early growth, uh, cow size, how much milk they're going to produce, male and female reproduction, and a bunch of carcass traits. So you've got reasonable coverage of all the different things that contribute to profitability in a commercial cattle enterprise described in the EVVs. Across the, all of those, we've got a description of how good the animals are genetically. There's uh, other traits under development or in some use at the moment, including for feed efficiency. That's a measure of how much the animal is eating in order to grow and produce the carcass. Some animals eat more to produce the same amount of carcass growth than others. And we've got methods now to measure that and turn it into an EBV. Similarly, structural soundness, how well the animals are put together, how long their, how, how their legs are likely to stand up to, uh, to walking around and so forth. Uh, tenderness of the meat, very important uh, trait that determines how customers think about the meat that we're selling them, is uh, traits available. Uh, temperament, I'm sure you'd be aware some breeds have uh, been measuring temperament of their cattle and getting EBVs on them for 10 or 15 years now and have quite radically changed the temperament of, of particular breeds that used to have a reputation for not being all that easy to handle and um, so they've change that. They've used EBVs and they've made those animals much more docile. Um, in the future, and I'll get back to this towards the end of the talk, we're going to have to think about whether this very comprehensive range of traits, plus some of these, is going to be sufficient. Is it going to describe everything we want to be able to, to describe in the cattle that your customers are going to want in 10 or 15 or 20 years time? So there's a bit of kind of uh, hopefully stimulating you to think about the future today, um, decisions that you make in the next year, five years and so forth, will in fact be determining what sort of cattle your customers buy ten years out. So it is worth at least thinking about are there the things that we're not getting EBVs for today that would be helpful. Same new markets, you know, people want, might, might want marble score ten meat in five years time. Um, who knows? So, well, we can have that debate just before morning tea. But the key thing there is this, I started off by talking about genetic variation, the genetic differences amongst animals. All I've really done so far is to say we can describe those genetic differences in a really simple, accurate way and it's EBVs and there are some example EBVs for some Hereford cattle. And they can be combined into different combinations. I think, yeah, I won't spend too much on this slide because I suspect you know about, but indexes 
put together different combinations of EVVs to help you decide which are the best animals for a particular purpose. And this index here, the grain fed steer index, is based on the economics of a system where people are selling the steers into a grain feeding system, so there's going to be some premiums for marbling you would think, and this plus 66 tells us that's the value of the genes of that animal for each um, cow that's joined to produce that sort of um, production system. And if there was another animal that was, I don't know, plus 50 for this, this bull, if it was a bull, would be producing, or each time it was joined, would be producing $16 extra value because it's got the right genes for that production system. So that's what these indexes are about, is putting together packages of, de of EBVs for particular jobs. I suspect Andrew's going to spend a bit of time on that tomorrow. Let's just have a look at a couple of um, nice, neat examples. Um, this is growth EBVs, and these two bulls are, well, they're both Herefords, I'm pretty sure of that, but one of them has got genetics of plus 118 kilos at 600 days, so it's got really good genetics for growth, and this hasn't. Let's leave it at that. But that's, I mean, even if that one was bigger, which doesn't look like it is to me, but it's like nobody could pick that that animal had genetics worth 100 kilos better than this one. But that's what the facts are. That's what the EBVs tell us, and we know that because we've, we've seen this sort of thing trialled with uh, progeny. And you get r half the difference between that will be what you see in the progeny, and that's a 50, 50 kilo difference in the progeny at 18 months, and nobody could afford to miss out on that. Um, here's an example where we've got two animals that are very similar for growth, but very different for their birth weight breeding values. So this guy's going to make cows work a bit, and this guy's going to pop calves out uh, like really easily, and you could not tell that by looking at that either. Um, so this is, a, this is another point I'll keep coming back to. As long as we've got some records in the population for both these traits, we can disentangle those two. We can, in the old days it was kind of like, oh, well, that's a big animal that's going to have big, uh, big birth weight. But they don't have to go together. You can find animals that have got very high growth rate and very modest birth weight. All you've got to do is record and evaluate, get the EBVs, and you can pick the bulls with the right combinations of traits. Here's two animals again, similar growth rate, very, very different birth weight. There's something wrong with these cattle, I think. I don't know, they're all black. But, um, so we'll skip on from them. Um, here we've got extreme differences in uh, the amount of milk their daughters are going to produce for their calves. This, this guy's daughters basically don't give very much to their calves at all. This bloke's giving them about 30 kilos worth of milk. So again, you can almost any trait you can think of, you can get an, an EBV for. So all I've done there is just give you some examples of traits for which we, we can map the genetic variation or the diff genetic differences using breed plan. And I hope you realise from that there were several different traits and combinations of traits. And as long as you've got the data, you, you can find out about the genetic merit of those animals. Now that's neat and it helps you def def describe the product you're selling to your customers <coughs> so they know what they're actually buying when they buy a bull from you. But the other thing you can do is make genetic progress. And John very kindly mentioned, probably because I wrote it for him, um, the thing about me breeding very large fruit flies when I did my PhD. And I kind of like the reference to The Simpsons, but um, hopefully none of you will tell anybody. Um, but it's kind of neat because um, the great thing about fruit flies is they take two weeks to go through a generation. That's why people do research with them. And so I went through, I think it was something like 40 or 50 generations of selection with fruit flies, which, um, let's put aside the Simpsons references now, because I, um, but that's what I did. But in the course of that time, I did make uh, breed fruit flies that were three or four times as big as I started. And People, people very often say when uh, geneticists talk about uh, breeding, 
sooner or later it'll, we'll run out, it'll stop, you know, we, we won't make any further progress. Well, there was a guy who just finished his PhD when my, I started with the same professor, and he was a, a South Korean, which probably explains what I'm just about to say. But when he went back to South Korea and kept working in their equivalent of CSIRO, he kept some of the selection lines going that his, my supervisor had started, um, not for the same trait, but, and he kept them going generation after generation after generation just to see how long people could keep on changing the, the particular trait in those flies. And they got to 90 generations and they were still going at exactly the same rate as they were at generation one. And that is basically universally the case. Um, people have looked at, and I'll give you a few examples in a moment, but people have looked at many, many traits in many species of animals and plants that have been uh, uh, subject of research or in fact commercial breeding where people have been selecting for something for a long time and there is no sign of running out of genetic variation which means you can keep on making progress at whatever rate you like. And we might come back to that because you might say, well, growth rate's a pretty good thing for cattle. Um, could we keep on selecting for growth rate? The answer is yes. And then you'd say, yeah, but hold on, the cows would get really big, and they would. Um, so you have to start to say, well, what is it we really want? And if we said, we want fast growing animals when they're young, but we don't want them to get bigger than, I don't know, 500 kilos. Well, as long as you had the records for their adult size and their growth rate, you could make them grow faster and faster and faster, but still flatten off at 500 kilos. If that's what you wanted to do, and as long as you had the measurements for growth and the measurements for their adult size, you could take that as long as possible. And there might be better ways to achieve very high growth rate in cattle enterprises, but nevertheless you could do that. So one of the big things that you'll have to think about is, is kind of productivity of the females. How big do you want them? And I'm sure you want them to be kind of moderate size. That's a great, that's quite smart. But you still want their calves to grow as fast as possible. And even if they're growing fast, you want them to grow faster. Because the faster you can get them out of the system, the better it is. And so it's really just a, that's a bit long-winded about the fact that you can select for things basically forever. There is no such thing as selection limits in almost any circumstance. Let's have a look at some examples of genetic progress. The, the whole point is we're changing the gene, genetic makeup of the animals and we're sort of exploring that space of that huge amount of genetic variation and it's really important to think about where we go. That's what people like me call breeding objectives. You've got to think about what it is you're going to create because you will get it. That's one of the things. You set out to breed for something, you will get it. So it's really worth thinking about what you want to get. Um, we'll touch on uh, what drives how fast we make the progress. I'll go through those things in just a second. And I'll reinforce the point, EBVs are what make it possible. Doing breeding by eye and memory, some people are moderately good at, but there is no question using the tools that BreedPlan makes available make it much, much, much faster. Now, um, these are two chickens. Um, we won't spend long on chickens, but the difference between those two, they're just the result of selection from an ordinary old chook. This one presumably was selected for size, got that right, and this one not, but that's nothing else. They've just been selected. For how long? Uh, 40 generations, which I suspect is about 20 years. And you can see this, the up line, that's pretty much commercial chooks. That's about what commercial chooks do when, you, uh, when they're sold. So this is a down line to see what happened. And they've got a lot smaller. That is basically the commercial broiler industry worldwide. So they set out to say, we want, we want we want birds that reach whatever is table weight, and table weight is about one and a half to two kilos at the moment, but we want them to get there faster and faster and faster because that reduces costs. And I think from memory, they now take six weeks to reach slaughter weight and it used to be 10 or 12 months. And there's no reason cattle couldn't do the same thing. Uh, this is Holstein cattle or Holstein Frisians. 
and this is daily milk yield. This will be an American population, I suspect. Back in the 60s, they were producing about 22 litres per, year, uh, per day, and now they're up over 40. You might say, well, hold on, they eat a bit more too, don't they? And yes, they do, but they turn it into milk. It, it, these animals back here, if you fed them as much as these animals today, these animals just could not eat it, and what they could eat, they would have just turned into body fat. These animals turn it into milk. That's what they bring bred to do. So that's, uh, what's that, 50 years, about 15 or 16 generations, and the rate of progress is still just as fast up here as it was down there. Um, these are some cattle in a research program at uh, Trangy, up in central New South Wales, that were selected for growth rate. This is the high line, the middle line and the low line. That only took, I think, seven years to make that difference, and people studied lots of things about these cattle and learn about their efficiency and so forth, but it didn't take very much to create that difference. And there you can see that was the high line and the low line, sorry, it took about 12, 15 years, but uh, that's about seven years there. So um, selection in either direction worked. Uh, that was single trait. Here's some nice photographs of Herefords and um, you would know a lot more about the differences, although I know these were belt and buckle cattle and these were cattle you could walk under and this is reasonably modern ones. Uh, you people will decide what that picture looks like. There will be a Hereford in whatever that is, seven or eight years time. There may not be as many as there are today, that'll depend on you too. But, ooh, but what it looks like will be the result of, of decisions you make as individuals and as a breed. Now, just to show you, we've got some, some real Hereford examples as well. This is a, one particular Hereford herd in this country. I'll just go through three or four traits. Um, this is birth weight, so Hereford cattle in Australia have been getting heavier at birth. They're sort of flattening off now. This herd was tracking basically the same progress and has now decided they want to reduce birth weight, make it easier on the cows and so forth, and they've done so. <coughs> Now, calving ease has gone up in this herd, whereas it's kind of steady in the breed as a whole. So the breed's producing bigger calves than it used to. Calving ease hasn't changed, whereas this herd has said, no, we're going to have smaller calves and calving ease is going to go up or improve. Um, the growth rate of the cattle in this herd is basically bang on uh, the breed average. So the, the growth rate in the slaughter progeny is just the same. But the cows, they're starting to uh, make their cows a bit smaller than they were. Oh, they're not getting bigger as fast. And there's one more trait here, or two more pages. Scrotal size, they were lagging behind. They're now well ahead of the breed. So they're basically that means the daughters of the bulls of this herd are going to be more fertile. And you can see that oh, reflected in uh, days to calving EBV. This herd is now well ahead of the breed. And lastly, a couple of carcass traits. Thanks, John. A um, couple of carcass traits, muscle area. The uh, breed and this herd were sort of tracking along roughly the same sort of rate back in the 90s. This herd's decided to improve it and is a long way ahead of the breed. And the same for intramuscular fat or marbling, pretty much tracking the same, and now well ahead for intramuscular fat. Now, just think about what I've just done for a minute. I started off with what was it? Uh, birth. So we had birth weight, calving ease, 400 day weight, mature cow weight, uh, scrotal size, days to calving, eye muscle area, and marbling or intramuscular fat. And every one of the trends in that herd is in the favourable direction, or what I would consider to be favourable for most circumstances, and is now considerably faster than the breed. Now that person's not doing anything radical. It's not like they've found some magical population of Herefords overseas that are much, much better than Australian ones. They're breeding better Hereford cattle than the breed average in every single trait that we looked at. So you can, you can select for any combination you like and you can do it. Um, and that's put it all together in an index and that's pretty much what you'd expect. Um, 
That herd's currently improving that index at about 750 a year. The breed's doing 250. And that, that's a reasonable measure of how much money the bulls that the breed as a whole is giving to the clients who buy Hereford bulls when they sell bulls. And this is how much that herd's giving. Because every cow bulls from that line are being mated to is generating 750 extra profit these are only doing 250. So every bull this guy sells is giving five dollars per cow more profit to the customers. And it's made up of a whole range of traits and you can do them all together. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because um, it's kind of a bit more mathematical. I want to get to the perhaps the more important <laughs> point for this talk. But it's a fairly simple equation that actually tells you how fast the genetic progress is. It has to be simple so that people who spend half their life selecting fruit flies can actually follow it, right? So this is not rocket science. It, um, this sign over here is just a sign for rate of genetic progress. Uh, this I is how hard are we selecting? Are we selecting very few or are we selecting lots? This one's the accuracy. That's basically the accuracy of the EBVs or the index. And this is how much genetic spread we've got in the population. And this is how, fa this is how fast we're turning over the genes. So if we keep uh, bulls for a very, very long time in the herd, we're not turning genes over almost at all. Um, and so we want to turn over, if we want to make progress, we turn them over faster. Now, I'm not going to spend very much time on that because it's, it's relatively simple. You, you need to pick the best animals for the things that are important and turn them over quickly. Now, um, Hereford, as I said a minute ago, on that uh, grain-fed index, currently the, the rate of progress is about $2.40 extra um, gross margin per year per cow. That's not bad, it's about 1%, but there are people who are making three times that rate now and they're not doing anything particularly difficult. Um, there's no question the Hereford breed could double its rate of progress and to do it, it really just means focus on selecting the... Do you want me to stop for a second? Or? No, that's all right. no, that's all right. um, it really <coughs> just means focus on selecting the very, very best animals you can and get as much records together as you can because if you don't record something, you can't select for the best genes. Um, I want to skip this because, again, it's a little bit of maths, which I don't think is going to help. Um, I just want to talk, though, about this fundamental point about the accuracy with which we pick the genes. And that's really just a function of how much has been recorded. If you don't record something, you can't work out the value of the genes. And we've got um, a little summary here of the, the typical accuracy in three breeds for a range of different traits at the moment. The three breeds are Angus, Hereford, Shorthorn. This is in Australia right now. And what we've got is the EBV accuracy for young bulls and cows for a range of, of different traits. Gestation length, birth weight, 600, cow weight, yield, etc., etc. And if you look across there, I'm sorry to say, but you'll see that for every single trait, so this is the average accuracy of young bulls of those three breeds for uh, Angus, Hereford, Shorthorn. So basically 12 month old animals, what's the accuracy of their EBVs? And that just is really just telling us how much data has been recorded. <coughs> Angus, it's up over 50%. Hereford's just over 40. Shorthorn's a bit better. And you can see that pattern basically is maintained for everything. The differences in height are a bit to do with how strongly heritable the traits are. So don't worry that these ones over here are a bit lower than here. The really important thing is, in virtually every case, the Hereford breed is making it harder for itself to pick animals with really good genetics because you don't record enough. And where you do record, you don't record enough traits. And so you can't kind of look at the genes of the animals with as powerful a microscope as Angus people can at the moment. Some of it's because they're recording more and some of it's because they take more care with their records. And it's probably a bit uncomfortable, but it's true. And if you don't do anything about it, and if all other things were equal, 
um, if that pattern was consistent across there, let's say it's a 5% difference, then Angus would be 5% faster progress for everything than you. It's as simple as that. How much you record and how hard you select determine how fast you'll make progress. And if you're not recording quite as, as much as Angus, you're running in a 100 metre race and, I'm sorry, but you've only got one shoe on, or however you want to describe it. You're making it harder for yourself. So this whole question of what is being recorded by how many people is absolutely fundamental to how many bulls you'll be selling in five, ten years' time. I won't go into the detail there. Just to reinforce the point, there's currently about 20,000 new Herefords being recorded, I think it's perhaps 25, across Australia and New Zealand, that's okay. Um, most of those animals are coming in in breed plan herds, but there's a lot of variation across herds and traits. Some people are recording a lot of their animals and doing it really well, and other people are actually not contributing very much to the breed at all. I think Andrew's probably going to talk a bit more about that tomorrow. So the key point there is what each person in this room and the rest of the Hereford breeders are doing in terms of recording determines how all of you will go in terms of finding better bulls and what the market share will be five, ten years out. So people who are not recording are holding everybody else back. Uh, we'll talk about the bin shortly and genomics. Um, just to just to quickly summarise the things that are important in Hereford cattle, this is the current weightings in one of your main indexes. Um, it's got a fairly heavy, uh, something like 33% of emphasis on calving ease, about a quarter on carcass, 30 or so on growth, and the balance is repro. And the problem is that the recording does not match that because most recording is growth traits, and that's only about a quarter to a third of the total index. And this is a, a way of showing that in a little bit more detail. Um, this is the number of animals coming in in total, the number that come in with breed plan, and then we've got the weight traits, so approximately half the animals are getting at least one of the weight traits. If we then go to calving ease, a quarter of them have got it, uh, barely any have got days to calving and if you get down into some of these these carcass traits out here you're looking at whatever that is two and a half maybe 10 percent of animals have got those records now it's not necessarily the case that, ooh, that everything should have all these traits but you're really restricting yourself by the small number of carcass records that you're getting in the breed um, some of the things that I think are clearly priorities based on that very quick summary now is uh, abattoir carcass data, the bin project that Jeff will be talking about is collecting some of that, but there's no particular reason why you couldn't be getting more. Female reproduction is really important. Getting good records on days to calving and calving ease, the more the better. Um, mature cow weight, people should be weighing their cows in the, in the bull breeding herd uh, at least once a year because otherwise as you select for growth rate you're just going to make bigger and bigger cattle and people won't be able to run them. And heifer scanning is a good way to get at how early they are uh, becoming fertile. So there's a bunch of things that you could consider might be breed priorities to think about for everybody to do, no question. It's up to you how you work out that sort of conversation but I can tell you if you don't improve the recording of those traits you will not improve them. And if someone else in the business is improving them, you'll fall further and further behind. There'll be other traits that are worth thinking about, kind of like temperament and structure. Um, maybe cow traits like how much methane they're producing. Health traits like BRD. Do the, do the steers get um, respiratory diseases when they go in the feedlot? <coughs> Feed intake, methane I mentioned. All these things are kind of like features of the Hereford uh, animal that you could think about doing something about. If you want to improve them, all you've got to do is record them. If you don't improve them and someone else does, they'll buy that car, not yours. Because that's really what this is like. It's very like designing cars. 
Back in the old days, all they had to have was something approximating an engine and four wheels and ideally a steering wheel. But now you've got to have brakes and GPS and CD player and blah, 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 in order to sell even a cheap car. And essentially what you've not done in the last 20 years is keep up with the features that should be in the modern cow. Um, abattoir records, I've already <coughs> said, you really do have to get some abattoir records. Organised progeny testing is a way to do it. You should certainly follow up with the people at MSA about getting MSA index on, uh, on lines of steers that are going through where you know the breeding and feed it into breed plant because it, it's very, very useful information, particularly for marbling and yield. Last two slides, John. Um, so this is a couple of challenges for you to think about over morning tea. The first question is, what are your competitors doing in genetics? Your big competitor is Angus in this country, and they are just sweeping the floor with you at the moment. They record more cattle, they record more traits, they record each trait better than Herefords do. And if that stays the same, all other things being equal, you will never catch them. And I'm sorry, there's no way to, other way to say it. It does come down to what you record and how you select and your big competitor is doing a better job than you. Um, will your competitors go away in 10 years? Like if you kind of sit here and have a meeting every couple of years and some nice scones, will you wake up one day and there won't be any Angus cattle? Wouldn't that be nice? Um, I, I suppose it's possible, but I don't think we should spend too much time dreaming about it. Um, a crossbreed EBVs is something that uh, are worth thinking about whether it's routinely or just as a piece of update information each year, basically they would tell you how you're comparing with Angus and Shorthorn and uh, Charolais and Limousin and other breeds for every single trait that's been recorded. And if I could find someone to give me that sort of information on my competitors, I would be very, very pleased. Because you usually you've got to find it out for yourself and it costs a lot more money. Um, it's really worth knowing what the competition's doing. It uh, focuses the room focuses the mind remarkably. Um, we'll talk about genomics afterwards. I think, uh, I've said this a couple of times, but you've really got to think about the whole performance recording culture of your breed. It's, um, sadly, we live in a world where if you can't define performance and improve it, you'll be off with the chicken fanciers at, um, or the chook fanciers, sorry, at the Melbourne show. And that's quite a pleasant place to be and it doesn't cost much and all that sort of stuff but you won't be selling bulls at reasonable prices. So you've got to get performance recording into the breed on the, the highest scale you possibly can. And I think you've got some very hard decisions, both as individuals and as a breed, about how you go about breed improvement. Because to date, and this applies to Angus, by the way, and, and anybody else, the decisions about improving the quality of a breed, which is just a brand, have been left to individuals. With very, very rare exceptions, no breed has said, if you want to be a breeder of this breed of cattle, you'll record the following 10 things, and these are the bulls you can pick. Now that's what they do in France, for instance. It's what they were doing for a very little while in Simmental in this, in this country. Needless to say, it doesn't go down very well with um, Australians or Americans for that matter. But the problem is, if you don't achieve that level of performance, you're still competing with people who do. And so you've got to work out a way of achieving that level of consistency and high performance without it being forced upon people. I, I can't imagine you could force, you know, everybody has to do everything we tell them to through the Hereford Breed Association rules. But if people don't achieve that level of performance, you're still going to be competing with people who do. So you've got to work out how to solve that problem. Um, I'd really want to stress that had I or David Johnson for that matter or anybody else been giving this talk 20 years ago, we would have been much more uh, circumspect about some of the predictions and some of the things we've said. 20 years ago we weren't as confident about the sorts of things we're saying about recording and selection as we are today. But in every species in the world people are using this sort of technology like breed plan and they've learned, if you want to make progress, you record and you select the best and it works. So I've said here, there is no technical uncertainty. This is not 
maybe this science will work, maybe it won't. This is almost as reliable a technology as you could find on this planet. It just comes down to, do you record it, do you select the best? Um, and, and you can improve any combination of traits you like. It, you know, you might want to improve a hundred things, well record them and select the animals that have got the best genes for it. Um, I think you really do have a challenge about how you think of yourselves as members of a breed. Because both as individuals and together, you've got to decide what sort of cattle you want your clients to be getting from you five, ten years out. You're the people who'll determine that if they're still buying bulls from you. So you've got to think what is going to make them the most amount of money possible that I can deliver. And then it's just a matter of delivering it. It's, it's been kind of nice for 150 years. Everybody had their own ideas about cattle breeding and they got together and they sort of agreed to have the same coat colour or whatever. But it's not that world anymore. We now live in a world where there is no technological uncertainty about this. And it is just about how much value do you <coughs> deliver for your customers. And if you, someone else is delivering more than you and they're improving it faster, you will lose market share. It's as simple as that. And that really challenges an association of people who, in a sense, all you've got in common is that the cattle are red with white faces. I personally don't think that will be good enough to ensure you have a meeting this big in 20 years' time. So, on a sort of positive note, the good things are there is a huge amount of genetic variation there to work, to work with. You could breed Hereford cattle to be anything you like. So don't, please don't think I'm saying, you know, you're, you're stuffed forever. There's plenty of genetic diversity in Hereford cattle <coughs> and you've got the tools to measure it with. More and better recording will lift your accuracies. It'll allow you to find the best bulls uh, more easily and heifers for that matter. Select on EBVs and dollar EBVs. You've got really good people. There's no question about that thoughtful, really understand cattle, really understand humans. You've got to put those skills together. You've got a good board and CEO. But it's, it's putting all those talents together that I'm really stressing. But ultimately, I think you must improve Herefords faster. Simple as that. Sorry, I was going to go to the phone.